everyone and welcome. Uh, this is our fourth of the Public Art Talks here for the MFA Visual Arts January 2024 Residency on this resident program, Ben Slurk. We will start our program with a land acknowledgement. The Wesley University here in Cambridge resides on the ancestral and unceded land of the Massachusetts people, whose name is appropriated by the common law. We pay respect to the Massachusetts peoples and their neighbors, the Wampanoag and Nipmung peoples, who have stewarded this land for generations, and we offer our appreciation to the lands and waters for sustaining us. Our general thematic for this residency is in translation, or in transition, which invites the question, holding the space of change, how can we embrace transformations of context and content in our art practice and lived experiences? Our program starts Sunday with a faculty talk by Alex Jackson, continues Monday with Andrew Butt, Tuesday with Sonia Onrieda, yesterday with curator Vivian Lee, and concludes tomorrow with photographer Christopher James. I hope those watching the YouTube live stream on our website can join us for that program. Uh, today's speaker, Eva Lunsager, is a painter whose works evolve, evoke expansiveness and a sense of watchful waiting. Structured as an imagined, changing space, imagery simultaneously specific and indeterminate to just life forms moving through atmosphere, over a planet's surface, and, into, and deep into solid ground. Several exhibitions of hers include those at Jack Tilton Gallery in New York, Greenberg Van Doren, New York, Gallery of Linfield, Munich, Sheldon Art Gallery, St. Louis, and Clay Shiloh's uh, here in the Boston area. Uh, please join me in welcoming Eva Lunsager. Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, and I just want to say um, it's really nice to be here at Leslie University again um, for the in transition residency. Um, I, put up here. <laughs> I put up here, well, it's nice for me. Um, I put up here an image of um, work that's in transition, on work that's like actively in the being made and not at all resolved. So I thought that was a good place to start. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at first about like my history because I remember like when I was a student that was always really um, interesting for me to kind of like read to, and learn how how other artists started and you know, made their life as an artist. Um, so I, I'm going to share some of that with you and then jump ahead to uh, more recent paintings. This is a bowl I made when I was 14, and I'm not going to go through every year. Um, <laughs> but but when, I, when, I was, uh, when I was 14, I started um, taking ceramic classes at the school in Maryland that was affiliated with Antioch University. And um, I studied there seriously after school and on weekends. Um, alongside folks who were getting their MFA. I was taking the exact same classes as, as them, but I just wasn't getting credit for it. Um, and it was a school with, that was founded by people who had studied in Japan with like Soji Hamada. Um, and they were teaching us in the classical Japanese way uh, with an idea of like a long um, apprenticeship. And that you had to really spend many years learning before you could actually create your own work. So they had this motto of like, um, freedom through knowledge, so you had to like study, a, so it wasn't about making your own work, but learning the craftsmanship. And after a while, you know, that's, that started, that kind of philosophy started to wear on me. Um, uh, I, I graduated from high school at age 16 and spent a year just working there at the Visual Arts Center. And um, then I finally like decided like, okay, I'm gonna go to college. I didn't really know what else to do. It wasn't so much um, a decision as just like, uh, what, what else am I gonna do, you know? Um, so I went to the University of Maryland, which is like, you know, I lived in Maryland and it was a school my parents would pay for. Uh, it was at a time where, you know, we weren't really taken around to look at different schools. So I land at the University of Maryland and I studied with amazing people while I was there. Um, the painter Nick Krushnik, the theorist and critic Jack Burnham, who at that point was heavily into his um, Kabbalah phase and a memorable um, assignment from that time was when I had to analyze one of Jato's paintings according to the sacred meaning of a single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it was just like an incredible um, look into a really specific way of thinking about art. And then of course, Anne Truitt, um, and at that time, she, when I was still a student working with her, um, she published her first memoir, Day Book, which probably some of you here have read. And um, she was really great. And in her, 
she said kind of the opposite. She had the opposite philosophy of the ceramic school that I had gone into, where I was like, when you need to know something, then you can go and find out. You can learn it as you need to know it. And that seemed a lot more liberating to make the work you want to make and figure out what you need to know to make it when you need to know that. And of course, Sam Gilliam, um, a very uh, a sweet, quiet person who took us around the galleries in Washington. Um, David Driscoll, the painter and art historian, very well known for um, doing a show in the 1970s, one of the first big, probably the first big survey of mm -hmm. African American art. And then Claudia DeMonte, the feminist artist, and Claudia was very helpful as I then moved on to New York and started working in the New York art world. Um, so I went, I moved to New York to go to Hunter, and as Alex Jackson said the other day, about <coughs> made a little comment about you know not loving grad school. I had a you know I was I was similar. It was very hard. It was very hard time and hard to get through the program. But these three people made it a lot better. Um, Susan Cryle, who is still alive and working, and I'm still friends with the painter Ralph Humphrey and the painter Marcia Hapke. So I feel like, you know, in my formative years, I was really blessed to work with amazing artists and to get the example, not just of like, you know, the educating they were doing in class, but just the example of somebody living the life and taking their work seriously and, you know, treating it with the importance that it deserves. And, you know, it really spoke to me. Um, and, but while I was going to Hunter, go, getting my MFA, I had to work. Um, and when I first moved to New York, I was doing temporary office works, um, temporary office jobs. And then um, uh, my, my teacher from Maryland, Claudia DeMonte, she was work, showing her work at Gracie Mansion Gallery, and she introduced me to them. And I got a, a job as a registrar, and all of a sudden I'm a registrar at this gallery that's in the newspaper all the time, getting written about a lot. Here, here you see Sir and Gracie, and Gracie is wearing a dress made by the appropriation artist Mike Bidlow, which is obviously a Jackson Pollock dress. And that was an incredible education. Um, they were at the time, I think the first show after I started working there was Peter Hujar's iconic photos, um, and they worked with the Fluxus artist Al Hansen, David Wanarovich, um, as well as like Judy Glansman, who I ended up living with, and Hope Sandro, other artists who are still um, alive and doing, actively working now. <coughs> um, and so then I got my MFA, and here you see me and my husband, Paul Ha. This is at my MFA show in 1988. So it you know, took me three years to get through the program because um, I was working full time while I did it. And then, then luckily, Hunter College had great structure where most of their classes were in the evening, so I could work during the day and then go to my classes. And I'm, you know, I'm doing my work, and the first year after you get your MFA, I think is the hardest. Um, and that's the year when you have to really make it a habit, now I'm really talking to all my students, um, make it a habit to keep making your work, find out a way to make your work, whether it's, you know, drawing for 10 minutes when you wake up. Just just keep it going. Don't wait to get the, a good studio. Don't wait till you have big chunks of time. Just keep making your work. So many people that I was in school with really stopped making art, stopped being artists within a couple of years. So I think that first year is really important. And right away, I, was, I did keep making the work. Um, I, I went back to doing temporary office jobs because it was less demanding mentally. I could work a week and then not work a week. Um, and I was trading studio visits with a lot of other young artists um, and trading work. And my friend, the painter Carl Ostendart, um, he, I think he did a group show with this young gallery, Stephanie Theodore, and he told her about my work. And I, Oliver Wasso, I think, still works with Stephanie. She's still doing great things, um, really active. Um, and so Oliver, uh, um, Carl Ostendorf told Stephanie about my work. She came to my studio, and uh, you know, shortly thereafter, Paul offered me a solo show. So that was my first show. It was a beautiful little show she put together. And I was doing, um, so you can see here, uh, these, 
I, at the time I was doing pretty small paintings, mostly oil on wood. And here's two other examples of a work from around that time, we're in the early 90s. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to talk about the titles a little bit. Uh, one thing that, I, that uh, I really remember from my undergraduate years was Jack Burnham saying you have that work that was not titled was just lazy. It's not complete without the title. So I've always titled my work. And, um, but the way that I was doing it at the time, uh, there was um, the new, every week with the, your newspaper, with your Sunday newspaper, you would get a paper TV guide. And the TV guide would have like these little short two sentence descriptions of the movies that were gonna be on TV that week. And I would pick out phrases from those descriptions <laughs> and uh, use those as my titles. And so I liked it that they kind of operated similar to the imagery, where it was evocative, suggestive of something, suggestive of a narrative, but not specific. And this, is, this was my studio for years. For 15 years, I worked where we lived, which means you know the living room became my studio. We didn't have a real living room. So this is where I was working in the 1990s in New York. Okay, and I'm gonna jump ahead and um, I'm jumping ahead like 25 years or 30 years and talking about the work of the last 30, the last five years. So, um, so this painting was shown at Praise Shadows Gallery last summer. Um, and like I look at this painting now, like the, the thing that's important to me, that where my eye always goes when I look at this painting is that the top edge of that dark green band going through the painting. And like I, my eye kind of rides along that edge and it, it, it to me it's like about um, traveling through the space of the painting but also about like the passage of time. Um, my work often has a horizon line or multiple horizon lines, airy brushwork that sets up this vast space. Brush strokes tend to be animated, uh, suggestive of movement, suggestive of like a life force. Um, I, I'll often think of the work as being these um, unknown, unknown natural elements that have an intelligence. It's a, it's a kind of nature, but it's a nature different from ours. Um, the paintings are about change, wondering what direction things are going. They have a quality of um, being, like I think of them as moments on the cusp of change. Like something is shifting, something is transitioning, something is changing, and we don't quite know where it's going. Oh, and then um, like with these paintings, I'm no longer, you know, you don't get the newspaper anymore, you don't get the TV guide, um, but I still, you know, titles are important to me, and um, a few years after my father died, I was in my studio, and we have this pile of where people put things that they want to give away, and there was this book about the history of World War II. My parents were from Denmark, and they were teenagers when Denmark was occupied by the Germans, and my father worked as a teenager in the resistance. And um, so I found this book, and it had been published in 1945, you know, just months after my father was released from a Nazi prison. And um, so I started looking through this book, and it was very much from an American point of view. And, you know, I started pulling out phrases, which have become the titles of my paintings. And even now, I'm still doing that. So they tend to be suggestive. Um, of some, you know, something happening. Transition, don't quite know what. <coughs> uh, and then during the pandemic, you know, we all started having, we, a lot of us had projects going. And I had these series of 16 by 20 inch canvases. And um, I was thinking about, okay, I'm gonna learn to paint 
very classically using quick drying paints on my underpainting and the slower drying paints on top. So it's kind of like researching classic painting techniques. And I, so I started out with like the fast drying paints on this series. Um, and with the idea that I was going to build them up with multiple layers of glazing, but you know, they just ended up being finished much more quickly. And it's about being observant and being open to real, realizing that it's done before, it needs less than you think it needs. Um, and letting it be done when it wants to be done, not forcing it to be done. So these actually happen really quickly with not a lot of layers. These were shown at Tally Dome Gallery in Dallas in September. This is an installation shot. <coughs> and these are some works on paper that were also shown in Asia. I'm going to show some works on paper, and I'm doing this for Audrey, who's in my class here at uh, <laughs> Leslie, uh, who, who asked if I was going to show any works on paper, and I said, well, I wasn't really planning on it, and she was, was so disappointed. It's like, okay, I'm going to put some in for you. Um, so this was also kind of a pandemic project, um, in this, or like late pandemic, in the summer of 22. It was super hot. Uh, it was too hot to work on big oil paintings and move them around. And so I found um, a box in my studio of older works on paper that I had never finished. And I decided like, okay, I'm gonna go back into these. I can set up a table, uh, point the fan directly at me, sit down and paint. Um, and, and so I spent much of the summer working on these. And you can see from the date that, you know, it was, um, there's an expanse of years between when it was started and when it was finished. This one's almost 10 years. These are watercolor and sumi ink, and I'm often using like the dirty watercolor mm -hmm. in like in, in all the negative space in here, letting little bits of pigment that are in that dirty watercolor um, become forms. We're playing with um, wet on wet or wet next to dry, and as in with the oil paintings, working with a lot of different painting processes and letting images come out of the process. Letting spills and things start to suggest imagery. Back to canvases now. I'm gonna read um, a little text. <coughs> After, when I had the show at Prey Shadows here in Boston last summer, um, the folks uh, who edit Agni, which is a literary magazine published out of Boston University, invited me to do a project there where they reproduce some of the work. And they always ask the artists that they're showing, in, uh, that they're publishing to write a short essay about whatever they want, as long as it's not about the work specifically. So I'm gonna read to you a little bit from that. And this painting is titled A Pause, and it's really thinking about, you know, the pandemic was a kind of pause for a lot of us. For some of us, it was actually um, a welcome pause in some ways, a stepping back. Of course, for others, it was a really tragic pause. And this is titled Reflection on Painting, so I'm just gonna read a little excerpt. 
I don't know why painting matters, but I'm certain that it does. By painting, I mean both the act and the object itself, that thing that gets hung on a wall. Once finished and hung, it doesn't require a lot of maintenance, and it doesn't get in the way like one too many chairs can. You either look at a painting or you don't, or maybe you see it in your peripheral vision as you walk by. It's not quite in our world, yet somehow it describes the experience of being in the world. A painting on a wall might inspire reflection or even action. Above all, it creates a place where you can pause and just be. <clears throat> Artists make things as a way to respond to living. Through their art, they share ideas, jokes, philosophy, fictions, passions, and anger. Sometimes, these ideas are meant to be understood only by the artist. The texture of a painting suggests the body that made it, a body which moves through the world doing other things. The touch of flesh, the feeling of breeze on skin, the warmth and connection felt when holding a baby. I see all this in the indent indentations, the drips and splashes of a painting, and in the chips and cracks that develop on an old one. So I, I look at this painting and I, you know, just trying to share like a little bit of my own thinking about it. Like on the right, we have all these kind of like sedimentary layers of piled up paint, which uh, you know, suggest erosion and layers, which of course also suggests time. And then on the left side, you know, you have these much looser, airy passages. And I also think like there's moments of humor, uh, you know, like it's kind of these kind of weird cadmium yellow light and ultramarine blue forms in the top that start to become almost like the head of a figure. So playing with like the, you know, what the paint does, allowing it to suggest things um, and, and editing them as one goes along. <coughs> and I like the, I like how the paintings are made to be decipherable so that there isn't any secret to it. I want somebody to be able to look at it and, and know like, okay, this was done first and then that. Uh, in my earlier work, sometimes I'd get the reaction from people like, oh, how did you do that? That's so cool. And I just really didn't like that. Like, I didn't want it to be about how it was made, but I wanted the, um, washy green with these ascending drips. You know, they start to evoke like, um, like magical architecture or stalag, stalag, act, stalag, stalagmites. Um, and then there's this like, kind of island-like thing floating, which it, to me is reminiscent of my love for Marsden Hartley. These little eyes looking out on these kind of weird island formations. It's like, you know, there are times that I'll be laughing at like things that happen in the painting. Mm -hmm. A lot of like um, experimenting with like an, a curiosity. Like I'm, I'm, I'm curious what's gonna happen if I do this. So I'm trying something, I'm seeing what happens and you know, either letting it be, letting it remain in the painting or not. Here we have the accumulations of marks <coughs> and layers suggesting the sedimentary layers, like this big kind of dark mossy green form is, has these other little blue, dark blue dots surrounded by white under that are like see, seemingly trying to escape from that form. When I think about my work, I think about how things shift, things change. This moment is different from the next moment. There's a sense of anticipation. And this painting was one that um, 
in an earlier version of it, I had exhibited, um, you know, been shown and everything, and it came back to me, and I realized, like, you know what, I never quite liked that painting, and so I went back into it and reworked it. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I'm like channeling um, Albert Pinkham writer and you know, taking old work and reworking it. thinking about like the kind of curiosity of process that compels me when I'm making the paintings. Uh, so at one point, you know, this painting was, um, I didn't know what to do with it and it was like flat on the floor and I took another painting that had a lot of very wet pink and orange paint and just kind of held it above it and let that paint drip down. And then, so there were these pink and orange puddles towards the bottom. And I just lifted the bottom edge of this painting, letting the drips run up to where they are now. Uh, and just like, you know, watching it happen and like deciding when it is where it's supposed to be and stopping. And then thinking like, oh God, they kind of, they're, they're kind of flying around in this space. And then just this desire to make them into these flying islands and making little islands for each of those groupings of drips to live on. Oh, here's a, a couple installation shots. This is from the show that I did at Prey Shadows last year. Um, and in the right, that yellow bundle is one of Gene Shin's e-bundles there for seating, which I thought worked great with the painting. Um, and here's the studio as it looks right now. Uh, Paintings that are in progress, in transition, I've been working on them for a long time, probably since last spring. You know, you work on them and then put them aside for a while. Um, they're definitely not done. That's the studio as it looks right now. And here's some works on paper that are also unfinished that I started um, at McDowell last summer. I had my first residency I've, I've ever done, uh, which was really great. Here's a studio at McDowell, um, Eastman Studio. It was a really heavenly experience just to have that month where like, the only responsibility I had was to make the work. No shopping cookies, like cleaning. <laughs> Sonia nods. <laughs> you, you, know, you know, there you go. It was really wonderful. It, it, was, it was just really special and I met some great artists, wonderful people. And these paintings are, are still not yet finished. They're in my studio now. Um, I'm still working on them. And this is uh, me and Paul, my husband, who I met at, as an undergraduate in art school, and on a, a very early painting. And I'm gonna end with some, some thoughts that I just wrote yesterday. Um, you know, I think, I think like a lot of my work is about time, like moments, but also the expanse of time. And as I've gotten older, you know, you, you realize time, it goes by here and then it's gone. Um, but I feel a connection with people who I've known for a long time, even if I haven't known them that well. It's a connection I didn't feel when I was younger. And there are artists who maybe I didn't think of as friends when I was younger, but I do now because we have shared these decades, lived them together here on this planet, making art together, but in different places. I feel a sense of recognition, like we're aware of the shared years. Perhaps we know some of each other's heartaches and hard-fought accomplishments. I feel like in my work, I'm painting time or experience, but maybe that is what we're all doing. Great, uh, thank you, Eva. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just start with the one, which is, it really feels like you've developed your own visual language, something that's really kind of consistent over the years that yeah. you shared with us. And could you talk to us about like that development, that sense of knowing, that sense of 
this feels right or like this piece is finished, this piece is not finished, it goes on the shelf. Like there's, there's some kind of sensibility there that seems very consistent and very um, recognizable, like recognizably you. Uh, and I'm pretty, I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, like, you know, I think like even like the recent work has a lot in common with the very early work that where you saw no brush strokes and they were very small enamel-like paintings. Um, and, you know, I think there is like, the, there, there is still this, a threat, it's, it's such a hard question. You know, it's so hard to talk about our work. Um, but I think like throughout my work, there's just kind of this curiosity of like, I'm wondering, um, like the making itself, like I always want to see like, okay, what's going to happen if I do this? What's the next thing? You get this impulse uh, to do something and then, you know, then I react to it. Uh, I try to react to it. You know, sometimes you know, like, okay, that's just an impulse. I'm on autopilot. So I think there's like a lot of, and you have to know when you're on autopilot and be able to like, okay, I'm just doing that because I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Or I'm doing that because that's what it's really neat. And I, you know, it's one thing I'm teaching a class here called presence and process. So we, we talk about like, you know, this thing of like kind of watching yourself work and knowing when you work well, but at the same time, there's never any one rule. There's no one way. Uh, and sometimes you think like, oh, I worked so great today. I, I, I was a genius in the studio today. And you go back in the next day and you realize like, oh, this sucks. You know? and like, the, the genius was, you know, the Johnny Cash you were listening to, not what you were doing. So sometimes you got to turn the music off and, and you know, and just really be there. Um, did I answer your question? Sure, no, no. Because I, I guess there's such a mystery for, uh, someone on the outside trying to understand because for us there's a kind of amazing visual logic and but to understand where that comes from feels like a whole other situation but but it may be outside of language because it, it feels like it's something you've kind of cultivated in your practice or, or maybe just like outside of my language mm -hmm. you know like it can be really hard to find the words to say what i'm trying to do I think probably the my study of ceramics, where we were looking at a lot of um, like ink pa Asian ink paintings, uh, Korean ceramics. I think that probably, I mean, that was my first serious study of art and aesthetics, and you know, I think that has remained with me. That was beautiful, Tanya. Um, so beautiful, so interesting to see the paintings large and projected them um, was uh, they, they do very well uh, that way uh, I'm going to get to a question I, I, I have a slight that's okay you don't have to well, I, was, <laughs> I have a slight walk down memory lane here because I didn't really yeah, the exact same age 1960 yeah what 1960 you're born yes yeah me too um, and I went to Hunter in the early 80s uh, oh, I didn't go and I was there in the mid late 80s yeah I, I did an undergraduate and it wasn't in our department, it was the media studies program, though I did study with um, Marie Sperger, who was there at the yeah, time. Yeah, not yeah. only a few years older than me. Um, what? No, no, it's going to be more about me before I get there. <laughs> I am going to get there. <laughs> so I was born in Middleton, Wisconsin in 1960, in a lot of, in a lot of cabin. <laughs> But I was talking to somebody the other day about this moment in time. By the way, and I also had a gallery around the corner from Brady's Mansion. <laughs> what was it called? Wow. Cash New House on Avenue B. I didn't know that was you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So we I were, I'm sure we intersected many times. Yeah. Anyway, I was talking to somebody the other day about this moment in time when I was at Hunter College and trying to impress on them how there were these sort of taboos that don't exist anymore, and real sort of moral or ethical codes about art making, one of which was we were just kind of coming out of this period where you know, you really weren't supposed to puncture the picture plane, but flatness was still, you know, and seduction and beauty were sort of yeah. put down on and stuff like that. And I'm bringing that up because when I look at your paintings, I'm really struck by how, I don't, they're not abstract paintings, right? And I don't think of yeah. them as abstract paintings. I mean, you talked about but them. But I, I do think of them as abstract 
Do you? Well, that was my question. But, <laughs> that was part of my question. But for me, they kind of do like what a Gorky does or something, and that you kind of look at it and you find the stuff in I it. I do love Gorky. And you locate yourself in it. So I guess my question it was, you know, do you, where do you sort of position yourself in, in relation to abstract painting? But you, you know, I I still call mm -hmm. myself an abstract artist, um, and um, like with the early work, I definitely did, and I would call myself a process painter, and I was like really kind of in denial that they kind of that they evoked landscape. Mm -hmm. um, I have never been somebody to like sit out in a landscape and draw it. Um, just never. I mean, like I, so I do think of the images as coming out of like um, experimentation. I'm also, you know, was very interested in like um, Rothko paintings before he became Rothko, you know, the surrealist, more surrealist ones, and you know, surrealist techniques and things. But when you talked about the work, you talked about little eyes and little things, yeah, and things islands floating and stuff. So it yeah. seems like um, you're very aware that you're Flirting with representation. I'm flirting with representation, but like you know, in in the end, you know, it's it's not architecture and it's not a, a, a dead tree. You know, it's it's a drip. It's an upside down drip. So and so it suggests things, but they are not um, describing things. Maybe I'm, I'm sure you would have a better way of putting it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I just it's sort of to Ben's question: when you know something is done or not. I guess I'm curious if part of what makes something done is if it goes too close to representation, <laughs> or not close enough, or no. I'm trying. To, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm thinking so that I can like really genuinely answer. Um, I don't think it ever gets to that point. Like, I, it's it's never like I'm drawing something. Like, I'm never like thinking of a head when I make a mark. I'm making a mark, and then sometimes maybe it's. Like oh that kind of looks like a head. Mm -hmm. um, so there there are things in the paintings that to me like I can see like a real figure. Um, you know I I, I don't want to say it because I don't want people to be un able to be unable to stop seeing it. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and that, like I, I don't always see it. Like I think like when we look at our like how we see our work and what we see in our work changes over time, and what we see in other people's work changes. What we appreciate about any artist's work changes. We might, yeah. Thanks, Oliver. Hello. These paintings are so beautiful. They're so poetic for me, and I'm fascinated by your um, comment that you are interested in surrealist techniques. And so, I, I, but also, I want to know something about your practice. So I have two questions. Okay. Um, one, like, do you engage with this kind of, um, like, these practices that the surrealists had where they're doing kind of like osmotic drawing or like this kind of um, very, like, intuitive process that almost, like, creates this externalization of interior landscapes? Because I, I that's, that, that's something that really seemed to resonate for me about the work was that it seemed like a very intuitive landscape that maybe you don't want to call a landscape, right? But um. yeah, I, you know, I often think of it as being, um, I don't want to use the word representation, but I can't think of a better word. A representation of like what's going on in my brain. Yeah. Or like, like how I move back and forth between like negotiating life and the world and not getting killed crossing the street. <laughs> and, um, but also like the thoughts going on, you know, in the head, good and bad, you know, personal and global. I'll, I'll think of it as like a back and being about that constant back and forth. The um, second question um, is if you could talk a little bit about um, you. You have like a watercolor practice, it seems, and a you know, or, or work on paper practice. I don't yeah. know if you use something other than watercolor, and then obviously the works on canvas and. Um, how do those two practices relate to each other? Do you see them as part of each other, or are they, you know, do they influence each other through, you know, in what way do they influence each other if they do? Um, they're made very similarly, even though it's different material, in that um, like they're all, like 
people often think of like watercolor as being great because you can do it really quickly. John Singer Sargent painted those amazing portraits, you know, like in 20 minutes he would whip it off. And um, then, but I'm often doing like a little bit on a piece and then putting it aside and then coming back to it the next day, maybe working on multiple things and then coming back to it day after day. And as you can see in the ones that I showed you today, sometimes like, you know, just like not knowing what to do to it and then I just put it aside for a week or 10 years. <laughs> so they're kind of, they're made similarly. Um, and also with an idea like seeing what will happen, experimenting with the paint, um, you know, seeing what, what's gonna happen if I, you know, pour water on it here. But the, um, the watercolors are not studies for the learning. No, they're completely no. separate, okay. individual, yeah, no, finished. They're, yeah, they're yeah. their own thing. They're not okay. studies. Yeah. And I don't really, I don't do sketches. Like, I don't do uh, planning and drawing or anything. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What do you do when, what do you do when you get, um, when your battery runs out? Uh, okay, like, uh, like when when I want to work and can't, or or the engagement, the engagement, because there's when I'm my imagine my eyes and your work are um, they become I feel like I'm entering into an enchantment, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's got to be hard to maintain, like the enchantress. Right? And so, what are those, um, I imagine, because you've been at this for a while, that that would have peaks and valleys, um, but some of those waves that you pull the paint or recharge to, to re-engage when, when things slow down in that kind of momentum or yeah, like, I mean, I have gone through periods of time where, like, I'm working, but I can't seem to get anywhere that I like, you know, that I'm satisfied with. Uh, and that's why sometimes paintings end up take being in progress for a couple of years, because I keep, like, scraping it down and starting over and painting over. Um, but, like, you know, Life is such that, like, I have often had periods of time when I can't work, you know, like uh, raising children, teaching, um, having to write syllabi, uh, you know, things, things that keep me from the studio. So I, I do feel like every time I walk into the studio, like, I really want to be there. And um, even if I'm not, even if I end up, like, maybe sometimes not doing a whole lot of work, sometimes just sitting there with the work. Um, but yeah, I think like life has often uh, kept me away from the studio. So I think when I've gotten back to the studio, I've really wanted to be there. And I think you know, like I, I'm thinking about it all the time. Like he, when my children were really little uh, and, and Paul had to travel a lot, was working long hours and I was the caretaker, um, you know, at, at some point I just, you know, I can't work at 9 p.m. after I've been taking care of kids since 6 in the morning. And I decided that I'm just going to, you know, stop beating myself up about it and not work, you know, on the scale that I want to for a couple years until they're in school. And that was the right decision. And then, like, when I did, when they finally were both in school and I was, um, uh, I had a place to make work. Like from the first day, it, it just it flowed, you know. Because like you, I, you're thinking about it even when you're not doing, it, you know. And if you can just, you know, you can think about it all the time. And sometimes, you know, of course, you have to stop thinking. About it. <laughs> you know, and you know, m might not be healthy. Sometimes you got to get away from it. It's gonna take a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. about um, in one of the imagery there's a horizon line and that makes me think of that 
just gives me the impression of a moonscape, um, which may or may not be what what's going on for you when you're creating it. But I'm wondering if the, you talked earlier about the passage of time. I'm wondering if that has anything to do with what what's on the horizon or how close you are or far away you are from that point in time. I don't know. I'm just curious okay, could you about say that one more time? If it has anything to do with the horizon? Yeah, like the, the passage of time, does it have anything to do with, you know, getting closer to that horizon or where you are in relationship not, to it? Not consciously, but that, that, that's food for thought for me at the moment. Thank you so much. Um, I'm in Eva's wonderful elective course, and we have been doing all sorts of really interesting drawing exercises. And I guess I'm wondering if you would share with us, because you have in the class shared that some of those exercises you've tried out, but which ones, um, so that everyone can sort of benefit from those prompts, which ones are really important to your ongoing practice that are sort of things you fall back on. Um, I know they're not models for the paintings themselves, but they're an ongoing practice to engage with your own thinking. So. Um, I, like, like recently, like these last few months, um, like I, I've started drawing in a sketchbook like first thing in the morning, where I, often with, with my eyes closed, and just like holding a pencil super loosely, like like not like that, but like like that, and just sitting and, and like making marks, just like making marks without thought, just for a few minutes. And uh, that that feels like a good way to start the day. Just like look out the window and say hello to the world. Just trying, yeah. Look, you know, I think little things that we do every day can just be really helpful and really feed us both in our work and in our lives. Hi, um, I'm really loving your work. And I just had a question about, you said for a long time you could not be in the studio like full time. <coughs> Um, and you did little bitty things. Was it an hour or two hours? Is that up to us to decide? Uh, it, it could be like an hour a week, maybe. You know, it, 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 it was it wasn't a daily thing. It probably wasn't even a weekly thing. Um, but like you know, I, I would take the kids to the museum. You know, I, I was still reading a lot. <coughs> but but yeah, you're processing it in your head. Yeah, I, I, I imagining painting. I was thinking about okay, what do I? What, what do I want to do? So thinking about it, like imagining the, the physical of act of how you get there. Thank you. Any other questions? I wanted to, uh, to let students uh, take precedence. So thank you so much. The work is incredible, um, and uh, and I guess my question, uh, you know, very like roughly, is it seems to me, and this has certainly come up in in crit and conversation, that there is, uh, let's say, a portion of contemporary art, of the contemporary art world, that is very concerned with the so-called aboutness of work, that. You know, it's very thesis driven. Uh, the artwork is uh, considered, um, you know, a, a kind of message. It has a certain kind of uh, informational payload. It's directed in a very particular way. And uh, looking at your work and listening to you, it feels like there's a very, very elastic, open ended approach. And I guess I'm wondering, um, I guess I'm curious to just hear you maybe talk about that especially in relationship to some of these other approaches that are, you know, feel very, um, sort of, I don't know, I don't want to describe them as strategic, but maybe that's, that's I would say maybe thesis driven. Yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm just 
not that kind of an artist, you know. Um, I, 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 I don't do like conscious research, you know, where I think like, okay, I'm gonna go, I wanna learn all about frogs, you know, and go, like my, my research is more like, oh wow, I, I saw this interesting artist uh, on, you know, on um, some website this morning, and so I wanna learn more about that artist. So, like I think like, you know, I read all the headlines every day, you know, but yeah, I don't, for me, it's like, it's, I'm very much involved with like, like making things touch, you know, that might come be part of like, you know, what drew me to ceramics when I was in high school. Um, so yeah, I'm just like not that kind of artist. And sometimes like I, uh, you know, like definitely like in teaching, you know, I can get sad that people are like strategizing too much or like, you know, spending all their time doing research and not enough time like kind of enjoying the thing that made that, the making of things, you know, which is often what brought them to art in the first place, mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. were interested in looking and touching and making. Um, and sometimes I think that, you know, gets driven out. That's not to say that, like, I don't, you know, certainly there's a lot of more about this art that, yeah, like, it, we need it, you know, it needs to be out there. It's just like, it's not who I am. There's room.